I own this name. I've owned this name for a very long period of time. I think Cesare's done a great job as the CEO in terms of this is a U.S. centric bank, Mel, up 21% year to date. I think this thing can go higher. All right, and let's touch on energy stocks here, the worst performing S&P 500 sector this quarter, quarter with the group falling more than 6%. The picture only gets worse, though, when you take a look longer term, because energy is also the worst sector over the past 12 months, falling more than 20%. Is there more pain ahead for the space, or there's some opportunities after this deep decline? If you like value, maybe you'll like energy, Aaron. I think that's right, if you like value, but I think that there's still risk in the energy stocks. And I think it's gonna really take a catalyst for investors to get meaningfully longer energy. Mm -hmm. I don't see that happening here. I think if you wanna own energy outright, own the commodity. But you don't have to buy the underlying operators. I still think that the risks are ahead, particularly as we look into 2020 in the election. It gets a hard environment for the energy sector to really immediately break out. Where would you go in energy, Joe? If anywhere. Look, it's small exposure in the S&P, about 5.5%. I own Devon and I own One Oak, so I was happy to hear about Pete's unusual activity in natural gas. I don't think you get very excited about energy. Mm -hmm. I do think you have energy exposure. I avoid the high beta shale plays. I just basically stick uh, to your more conservative energy. Quick place. energy picks. KMI, it's easy. I'll tell you what, that, that really well run, and the guy just keeps buying his own stock back. You gotta love it. You love Absolutely that. Love you it. love it. Richard Kinder, he's the man. All right, let's hit the final trades here. Joe Terranova, what do you say? I'm gonna toss out Apple if you just think about everything that Pete and Aaron talked about. Uh, the behavior last fall was was just so wrong on the part of those that were selling it. Are they really gonna do that again? Aaron Brown of PIMCO. I like owning the defense sector. I think that this is a sector that's going to continue to be really at the positive end of any type of legislation that we're seeing. And given the tumult we're likely to face over the coming year, I think you want to stay invested in defense. Petey. Marathon Petroleum, another energy play. But this is less about energy right now, Mel. This is more about what's going on with Elliott and all the different decisions that are going to be have, having been made. So because of that, I think the stock goes higher. We've had huge upside buying, and they've been right, right, right. If this last guy's right, this thing's going up. I'll see you on Fast Tonight at 5. That's it for us. Exchange starts right now. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Here's what's ahead. China fires back on trade by saying it will increase foreign access to its markets. Could this be the first real win for America in this trade war, or is it just a hollow gesture, we will ask. Plus, more conflicting data on the economy. All this confusion has left the major averages roughly unchanged this quarter. Which way will markets break in the final quarter of the year? We'll debate that. And J.P. Morgan picks one big tech company for a 20% breakout. The fallout from Not So Forever 21. And is California picking a constitutional fight with the NCAA? That's all ahead in rapid fire. But we begin with today's markets. Dom Chu has the setup for us. All right, so the setup is green across the screen. So it might be a little bit more flattish for the quarter overall and maybe for the last year or so, but still today, we've got half a percent gains for the Dow, similar percentage gain for the S&P, and the Nasdaq up almost a full percent as well. We are still just below that 3,000 level on the S&P 500, so we'll keep an eye on that particular move there for the S&P. As things set up for the month in September, what could have been a rough month, the S&P 500 is up roughly 2% in September. Meanwhile, the best performing sector, believe it or not, is financials. They've had a pretty decent break almost doubling or more than doubling that particular performance in the healthcare sector, flat, the underperformer so far this quarter, or at least this month. And then we'll end here with a look at one sector that's been a huge focus for investors over the last year, that is the utility stocks. Up just a quarter of a percent today, but this move here, since those Christmas lows, this sector is up 26%, and we will let you off and put a star up here because that will be on pace for a record high close, Kelly, today, if these S&P utilities hold these gains into the closing bell. Back over to you. Yeah, six straight positive quarters, Tom. Thanks very much. Welcome to the exchange, everyone. I'm Kelly Evans. Here's what's happening at this hour. Senate Leader Mitch McConnell telling CNBC that if the That's House advances an impeachment and inquiry, he have no chance, choice but to take it up. Meanwhile, we were pulling its X1 registration document as it officially postponed Overall, its IPO. And noted China bear Kyle Bass downplaying the trade talks, saying any U.S. president could get the Chinese to buy food from us.
Yes, and that's where we begin today. China doing more than just buying agriculture, now saying they'll increase foreign access to their markets. This after reports the U.S. might block investment flows into China, which White House advisor Peter Navarro downplayed on Squawk Box this morning. Let's get more on this announcement from China and the significance of it with John Rutledge. He's chief investment officer at Safanad and a CNBC contributor. James Lucier is managing director at Capital Alpha Partners. And welcome to you both right now. John, I'll just start with you. Um, increasing access, you know, China increasing access to its markets. You, you think this is a real deal? Uh, well, absolutely. You know, it's, um, uh, it's something that was actually on the table as early as last February. It's not against Chinese interest. In fact, when you see them do something like this, it's very likely because they're trying to counter capital outflows, which weaken the RMB. And so they're, they're very afraid of those capital outflows. So allowing foreign assets in helps support the RMB, which is good for both sides of this trade dispute. James, what's this going to look like in practice and which U.S. companies and investors might benefit the most? Well, I think it's helpful to see companies like PayPal, for instance, finally get into the uh, Chinese payments market. But uh, we've been waiting years and years and years for this development. So I agree with John, it's a good thing. I agree with John that it's in the Chinese interest. But the reality is the Chinese have waited far too long. In the meantime, we give the Chinese access to our financial markets that is absolutely not reciprocated well, by they them. They don't even have to play by our rules, so to speak. They don't even, they can declare their financial statements are state secrets. Right. Come on, that's not sustainable. It's got to go away, and it will soon. But to your point about how they've dragged their feet on opening up their markets for access, even with this announcement today, does that mean they flip the switch on tomorrow and companies should really start planning for this, James? Or are they going to find this gets just continue it's, to get dragged out? It, it's a positive sign, but anyone who does trade policy for a living will tell you that the Chinese have bought the same Boeing airplanes five or six times. Hmm. Trust, but verify. I think there are a lot of other data that show that the Chinese do need to open up urgently for their own reasons, whether it's the structural slowing in the Chinese economy, whether it's their fear of excess reliance on credit and other forms of stimulus, whether it is just popular discontent, right. whether it is uh, the need to get better relations with the U.S. That's going a little into more than expected. And, I would note some the National Day. and John, do you credit the U.S. sort of a strategy and approach to dealing with China for getting this win finally on them opening up markets? Because I know you don't think that cutting off our investment flows to China is a good idea, but is that rhetoric working, even if the administration, if, if Navarro denies that they're necessarily looking into it? Well, to some, to some extent that might be true, but let's remember, Kelly, that they said open the market to foreign investment, not to American investment. That's a little more China than expected. China is in the middle and of rebalancing its entire portfolio of business and investments away from the U.S. and toward FedEx other places. And, and so this opens the door for uh, European investors and other Asian investors and other otherwise also. But the, destruct, the, the talks this weekend about delisting companies and restricting capital flows are really dumb. They, uh, they drive capital out, they lower the RMB, they raise U.S. prices in China, and they lower Chinese prices in the U.S. and make the trade deficit worse. So come on, guys, keep right. your mouth closed and get a trade deal done. Right, but unless it's actually helping to lead to this deal. But I want to ask both of you before we go, uh, James, real quickly to you. You mentioned popular discontent as also maybe being part of why China is making these moves. Here's a tweet from Hu Jin, the Global Times editor, who... My favorite. <laughs> yeah, we all follow quite closely for, for news on what China's thinking here. Um, he talks uh, about, you know, the Hong Kong protesters planning serious violence for October 1st, including killing police officers, you know, recruiting suicide attackers. Does the West, he say, support such democratic protests? What is this signaling to you about what the Chinese plans might be as these protests continue? Well, it's clearly signaling that they intend to crack down hard, but they're also worrying about uh, these uh, protesters. It also tells us that we're across uh, the negotiating table from people that attack the United States with the same rhetoric that might be applied by Iran to us. I mean, this is an irrational statement, uh, and it shows how important it is to normalize relations between the U.S. and China by having total transparency on both sides and not on one side only. John, are you concerned about what might play out here uh, tomorrow and in the, the days ahead in Hong Kong? Oh, we, of course, have now supporters in Taiwan, which is another interest of uh, China. That's a little more than uh, It's important for us to realize that China has neocons, too, not just the U.S. 
China's neocons are called the Shanghai Gang, and they're really the hardliners in this uh, story. It is uh, not possible for the Chinese government to back down in Hong Kong because it would open up all sorts of other troubles for them. Yeah. And so I think they're trying rhetoric uh, as much as they can, but I don't see the kids backing down either. So right. I have been worried about this for a long time and still am. Yeah, all right. We'll see if it comes uh, to a head beyond what we've seen already. Gentlemen, really appreciate it again today. James Lucier and John Rutledge, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, John. Moving on, the IPO market has shown some cracks in the past few months with a number of high-profile companies struggling. Now Goldman Sachs is warning their troubles may even get worse from here. And that's because companies with multiple share structures, like Lyft and Pinterest, for example, aren't eligible for inclusion in major averages like the S&P 500. For more, I'm joined by John Martinko. He's president of Drexel Hamilton. It's good to see you. Welcome. Thanks, Kelly. You know, I know you follow the IPO space quite closely. Yes, um, how problematic, look, ironically, the multi-share structure companies are actually outperforming uh, single share structures, but this is a big problem for them, isn't it? Yeah, and, and that report uh, put out by Goldman last week really gets into the fact that um, if you have multi-share class A and B, you might not necessarily be included without certain ex um, certain ex exceptions into their index and be indexed. And what you're giving up, according to that report, is access to $3.3 billion of passive fees to help put a bid to your, oh, to your company. I mean, if you're not in the S&P, every day we have a new stat about how that's how in, in, you know all the flows are going. So if you're these companies, especially the ones that have really stumbled out of the right. gate, it, does that put enough onus on you to make... Uh, these kinds of governance changes? I mean, if, if this whole process yes. wasn't enough to get you yes. to make these changes, might yeah. this uh, be a catalyst? Right, and I think you're talking about not even that process of being restricted from getting included in the index to access to those passive fees, but what we've seen recently on these valuations and the, um, the disconnect between the private going to the public and in the dispute around having those extra voting share classes, I think every CEO should take a hard look before they go into their public filing, they're, they know what they're getting themselves into as far as going public and having shareholders right. and giving up those voting rights. I mean, you are now under a very regulated industry. You should you should know by now professionally what you're about to, to right. get yourself Although into. Right, although a lot of the, so the Peloton CEO last week when he was on Squawk Box was asked about this, and yes. he said, I actually have diluted my stake to such a, a point. And he said it was three or six percent or something like that. He said, that's why I want this 10 to, or 20 to one structure. Right. But he said, I, I'm asked about it about a quarter of the time people will, will ask me about this. So is it, should we let the founders maintain some control of these companies? You know, they, they are the ones who put their necks on the line right. here. Um, it, how else do you bridge that gap if you want some control, but also want to make sure that your companies are in the S&P and that right. investors are rewarding? So, so I just, if, if you back up a second, though, when, when you're a VC-incubated company like Peloton and you have, in that segment, eight rounds of investing, um, you can exit not just by IPO, but you can exit through acquisition as well. So, for example, I took a look, just did some some look up of Ring, Ring CEO, very popular. The company that was um, bought by Amazon? Bought by Amazon, north of a billion. But that company culture and that CEO is still at the helm driving that business into his mission. Wow, well, that's probably the exception to the rule that most people believe, which is I'm setting myself up to be the next Instagram or WhatsApp or uh, there's a litany of other names, Oculus, where they, sure. you know, they go in, they hang on for a couple of years, but ultimately they're sidelined as the, the new parent executes on their vision. Right. So I don't, I don't know if that's something that is feasible for most companies to say that they're going to get the ring-like outcome here. No, no, it's not, it's not going to be all those outcomes are, are going to be different for everyone, but um, if you follow through on your thesis and your mission and your business plan, you should maintain some type of culture within your company. So final question, especially in light of WeWork pulling now right. its registration. Right. When they relist, mm -hmm. yeah, and they sounds like they're, that's their plan in 2020. New S1, right. maybe a new ownership structure. Right. What should that ownership structure look like, especially given whoever might be the, the new CEO at that point, what is see, seen as uh, an exception? Should they just go one for one all the way? Or what do you think is the acceptable move here? Sure, and just to reflect on that that report, going back to what you, you highlighted, um, do you go back to one share equals one vote or not? So it's still going to be determined. I'm probably not going to talk too specifics on that um, just because of uh, the exposure there. But any CEO, any management team does seriously need to consider those voting rights. And talking to some institutional, very large vanilla companies, 
they themselves look at those voting rights and the type of uh, consideration for the float for the percentage of ownership. They might be limited to the amount of uh, capital that they can bring in their indication of interest to sure. invest in that company. Yeah, because they have their so own. So all things yeah. on the table, all things considered it going into 2020. All right, we'll see uh, if it helps kind of improve governance structures. It'd be a good thing for everybody. I appreciate it very much. Thank you Absolutely. very much, John Martinko you, from Kelly. Drexel Burnham. Here's what's still ahead on The Exchange. Coming up, trade, the consumer, a divided Fed, and conflicting econ data. What narrative will win out in the fourth quarter? We'll debate. Plus, why Wall Street's middleman could be facing a reckoning. And it turns out forever doesn't always mean forever. This is The Exchange on CNBC. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. This means that travelling to the EU will change. You'll need to check online if your passport is valid for travel to Europe. If you're planning on driving, you'll need to check if you have the right documents to drive and make sure your travel insurance covers all your healthcare needs. To keep your trip on track, check what you need to do at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. No. 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 What are you doing? I don't like any of our preset radio stations. Ugh, we need a new car. With the Jaguar E-Pace at two nine nine a month on personal contract hire, you'll find a reason. That's better. And it's a Jaguar. Initial rental, £3,588. 48-month term, subject to status. 8,000 miles per annum. Excess mileage and return conditions apply. No ownership option. Ends 30th of September. Participating retailers only. Jaguar contract hire. Do you suffer from lopsided cakes? Lasagnas burnt on the outside yet undercooked inside? Then Curry's PC World have the oven for you. Hotpoint's multi-flow technology gives an even cooking temperature and perfect results every time. But it won't stop the kids spilling stuff, which is where the Hotpoint Active Care washing machines come in, removing more than 100 stains at only 20 degrees. And right now, you can remove 30 pounds of selected Hotpoint washing machines or ovens when you trade in your old appliance at Curry's PC World. Offer ends 22nd October. Welcome back to The Exchange. Wall Street is about to close out the quarter. The major averages are on track to finish with modest gains despite the major swings we saw month to month. Those swings driven by competing narratives. The U.S.-China trade deal is on. No, it's not. The consumer is holding up well. No, they're not. The Fed is going to cut rates again. No, not yet. Which narrative will win out for Q4? Let's bring in Paul Hickey. He's co-founder of Bespoke Investment Group. Art Hogan is chief market strategist at National Securities. And it's great to see you both. And Arnold, just start with you because the fourth quarter of last year broke pretty decisively in favor of the Bears. Um, how do you see the setup this time around? Yeah, the completely different, right? So the fourth quarter of last year, we were concerned about a Fed that was on autopilot. They were going to raise rates. Believe that they were going to raise rates yeah. three times. We were three and a quarter on the ten. Year. Right, and we're actually looking at a global economic slowdown that is still persistent, but it's not increasing in magnitude. We had the U.S. economy slowing down, but we're stabilized at trend growth of about two percent GDP. So completely different fourth quarter. We know what we know this fourth quarter versus last year where we did. Or maybe, Paul, the way to, to say it is that last time around, we had kind of reached peak optimism and then everything disappointed to the downside. The you know the U.S. growth, the global growth, like Art saying, all of that kind of dragged the, the averages down. Now are we starting off in what seems to me at least a little bit more of a pessimistic footing already here, leaving maybe some room to the upside. Yeah, Kelly, uh, I, I couldn't have said it better than Art there. It's two completely uh, backdrops that we have for the fourth quarter of last year versus the fourth quarter of this year uh, versus a tighter Fed versus a loosening Fed. But, um, you know, so I think when we look at the overall landscape here, we, we're starting with a more restrained outlook because we, we had this awful fourth quarter last year. Right. And we saw some weakness last week heading into the end of the third quarter. So there's concerns, are, are we headed for a repeat of the fourth quarter? But when we look at the overall issues, both positive and negative facing the market, we see more positives than negatives here. Uh, so we think the red from uh, the fourth quarter of last year may not necessarily be like gold medal type returns in the fourth quarter, <laughs> but, but silver at the very least. Sure. So I know both of you have kind of things you watch on your dashboard uh, to try to figure out what, what's happening with financial conditions. Art, first to you, what kind of screens to you and, and says, okay, we're, you know, things still look okay out there, um, 
versus those who you know say the slowdown's already underway, the yield curve is inverted, that's all you need to do. Right, so the twos and tens aren't inverted any longer. I think one of the most important things to us is there is no real distress in the credit markets, which is important. I think the most important thing for us that has inflected higher over the last three months is housing. So when we saw new home sales, existing home sales, better than expected, Great the housing point. prices coming in. That's such an important industry, and it's virtually the first time since the great financial crisis that we've seen that inflect higher. Housing's so important in and of itself to the U.S. economy. We've been waiting for a long time for uh, household starts, home formation to start picking up, and 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 you know, thankfully, it, it's turning the corner. So I think that's one of the inflection points that nobody's talking about. And so about. you're basically saying, don't lean against this economy or this market when you have something like housing turning up. Do you think that was just a temporary thing, though, because rates got as low as they did? I mean, when you have the right. ten year going below one and a half percent in August, we would say, well, we're already moved back up a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, it's more about inventory than it is about affordability in terms of rates. So it's the inventory shifting. I think home builders finally got it that. You know, there's two um, populations of people that want the same house. It's the it's the first time buyer, and then it's the it's the it's the boomers that are actually saying, "I want to downsize," and 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 they're going after that. There wasn't enough of that product, so that's been the problem for the last three years. Yeah, that product's increasing. Inventory's gotten better, and, and affordability's there. And so, Paul, as we look towards the fourth quarter, I'm also curious what kind of I don't know if technicals is the right term, but positioning you see in this market. So, as Dom mentioned off the top, utilities are up for six quarters in a row now. That hasn't happened in 20 five years, the financials were just the best performer for the month. What kind of, to you, shouts extreme one way or the other? Well, I think you look at the utilities and defensives uh, doing so well, it just shows you where the overall stance of investors is. You know, we're not chasing these, uh, you know, these high-flying IPOs. Uh, so there's more of a, definitely more of a restrained attitude on the part of investors here. Uh, the Breadth, uh, the S&P 500 AD, cumulative AD line hit a new high just in the last couple of weeks. That's led us out of every other correction we've seen since early 18 or, hmm. or pullback. So we, we have no reason to believe that won't happen again. Uh, you know, the S&P long-term moving averages are still rising. The economy is stabilizing, as we were saying earlier. You know, we're, we're seeing, we definitely saw the economy show signs of weakness, but it's not necessarily this rolling over type of activity right. that we've seen. So, and the big worry is, you know, uncertainty on the market. That could affect a lot of things. And that coming into the uh, Q3 earnings season, we're thinking to ourselves, okay, this could be really bad. Companies could really be citing uncertainty and problems with uncertainty in their calls. But the pace of earnings warnings heading into the end of the third quarter is right in line with the historical average. So we've wow, seen no up. meaning. Yeah, we've seen no meaningful uptick. Uh, versus this time in prior years over the last 10 years. So it uh, just goes to show we may see positive surprises there in the fact that analyst sentiment has been very weak and they've been lowering estimates heading into the uh, reporting period. All right. Well, that's all helpful. Guys, thanks very much. Appreciate it. And if you're wrong, we'll, you know, we'll do self-flagellation at the end of the quarter, <laughs> just like we did last year. Paul Look Hickey, forward to it. Art Hogan, thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Coming up from those disappointing IPOs to zero commission trades, banks have been feeling the pressure. How do you stay profitable in this environment? We will take a look. Plus, before the 737 MAX, Boeing's flight control system included some key safeguards that have been implicated in two deadly crashes. A new article sheds more light on why those were not part of the 737 MAX. That's ahead. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Find out what you need to do to prepare at gov.uk slash Brexit. No. 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 What are you doing? I don't like any of our preset radio stations. Ugh, we need a new car. With the Jaguar E-Pace at 2 dollars a month on personal contract hire, you'll find a reason. That's better. And it's a Jaguar. Initial rental, £3,588. 48-month term. Subject to status. 8,000 miles per annum. Excess mileage and return conditions apply. No ownership option. Ends 30th of September. Participating retailers only. Jaguar contract hire. Wood in the lounge. Tiles in the kitchen. Carpet in the bedroom. Sorry, no sound effect for that. Ugh, never mind. The new Dyson V11 Absolute at Curry's PC World senses, adapts, and deep cleans all floor types. It's Dyson's most powerful, intelligent cordless vacuum with an LCD screen that shows its charge level. Plus, get a Curry's gift card worth £50 when you trade in your old vacuum and buy any Dyson cordless vacuum. Try in-store today at Curry's PC World. Offer ends 22nd October. For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter, get further... 
Faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. Today, your information is more exposed than ever. When you shop, sign in, or browse, you could be vulnerable to cyber criminals. More online threats demand more protection. That's why new Norton 360 provides multiple layers of protection, combining device security, secure VPN, password manager, and cloud backup all in one solution. Get new Norton 360, starting at $24.99 for the first year. Searching for a more memorable short break? Fly from London Heathrow to Cork from $55.99 each way as part of a return trip with Aer Lingus. Step off the plane and into a warm welcome in Cork. Surround yourself with breathtaking coastal views. Soak up the culture of Cork City or head to the colourful town of Kinsale and indulge in the best seafood around. Smart enjoys a short break in Ireland. Smart flies Aer Lingus. Book now at aerlingus.com. Offer subject to conditions and availability. Welcome back to The Exchange and take a look at shares of Thor Industries, which are up 16% right now on pace for their best day in eight years. This after a profit beat, but there's more to the story. Let's bring in Frank Holland, our resident RV correspondent. Um, Frank, what's interesting to me about this is you flagged before this report the fact that Winnebago had done so much better than Thor this year. And there was no real fundamental reason to see why that gap should be quite as wide as it was. And now look at Thor today, make it up some of the difference. Having a great day. So this could be seen as a sign of some careful optimism in the global consumer discretionary economy. You have to know. Thor had an earnings beat today, but it was largely due to profits from its European RV maker that it purchased in February, Erwin Heimer. Almost all of it coming from the profits from that company. The U.S. still down, but you got to remember the U.S. is dealing with some very difficult comps from a record 2017. Okay, so the U.S. already had a strong period for RV sales, but you're telling me European RV sales are a bright spot? I mean, from everything that we read about the European economy, I would definitely not have thought that. You wouldn't think that. Over there, they call them caravans, and they're also a bit more high-tech than they are here in the U.S., a lot more focused on tech, but I spoke to Bob Martin, the CEO of Thor. He says over there, it's a much more robust market for caravans in Europe, and also they're planning on bringing a lot of that tech from Europe over to the U.S. to hopefully give a boost to the U.S. sales. So they call them caravans. Right. They're selling well. They're more profitable, I'm to understand. I mean, so... Is this just a case where the analysts were caught a little bit off guard by the strength of this performance of this particular business? It's a one-day move, and they still have a lot to prove? Or do you think this fundamentally changes the narrative about Thor relative to a Winnebago, for instance? Short answer is sales of RVs are declining from a record 2017, but next year's projection, even though it's a decline, would still be one of the top five best-selling years for RVs. So if you're looking at at, looking at it as a sign of the consumer, consumer discretionary economy, its strength or weakness, well, it looks pretty strong if it's one of the top five years of all time. Fascinating. Frank, thanks very much. Great Thank stuff. You. We appreciate it. Frank Holland. Now to Sue Herrera for a CNBC News update. Hi, Sue. Hello, Kelly. Hello, everyone. Here's what's happening at this hour. Former National Security Advisor John Bolton gave a pessimistic outlook on the prospects for getting North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons. This in his first public appearance since he was ousted from his post by President Trump. The DPRK has not made a strategic decision to give up its nuclear weapons. In fact, I think the contrary is true. I think the strategic decision that Kim Jong-un is operating uh, through is that he will do whatever he can to keep a deliverable nuclear weapons capability. A Utah Highway Patrol trooper escaped serious injury after a pickup truck in bad weather slammed into his cruiser while he was working a crash scene. It happened Saturday afternoon in Utah. Luckily, the driver was not hurt. And the NFL suspending Oakland Raiders linebacker Vontaze Burfecht for the rest of the season for a helmet-to-helmet hit on Indianapolis tight end Jack Doyle on Sunday. He was ejected from the game. The NFL called it unnecessary and flagrant and added his extensive history of rule violations factored in to their decision. And he can appeal that ruling. That is the news update this hour, guys. I'll send it back to you, Kelly. All right, Sue, thank you very much. Sue Herrera, here's what's coming up on The Exchange. Ahead, the tech giant that J.P. Morgan says could rally 20%. 
when forever isn't forever. California says it's time to pay student athletes, defying the NCAA, and the commuting trend that could have big implications for our economy. That's all ahead in Rapid Fire. We think you would really shine in the after. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Find out what you need to do to prepare at gov.uk slash Brexit. Train spotting. Morris dancing. Bog snorkeling. Do what you love and spend less time ironing. LG's V7 Series washing machine has Steam Plus technology, reducing creases and up to 99.9% of allergens. Or upgrade to the V9 Series with Turbo Wash 360 technology on a 39-minute cycle and great wash quality. Even for bog snorkelers, save up to £75 off selected LG washing machines when you trade in your old one. The Curry's PC World. Offer ends 22nd October. For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter... Get further, faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. Today, your information is more exposed than ever. When you shop, sign in, or browse, you could be vulnerable to cyber criminals. More online threats demand more protection. That's why new Norton 360 provides multiple layers of protection, combining device security, secure VPN, password manager, and cloud backup all in one solution. Get new Norton 360, starting at $24.99 for the first year. Searching for a more memorable short break? Fly from London Heathrow to Cork from $55.99 each way as part of a return trip with Aer Lingus. Step off the plane and into a warm welcome in Cork. Surround yourself with breathtaking coastal views. Soak up the culture of Cork City or head to the colourful town of Kinsale and indulge in the best seafood around. Smart enjoys a short break in Ireland. Smart flies Aer Lingus. Book now at aerlingus.com. Offer subject to conditions and availability. A rough start for some big-name IPOs in 2019. What's the message to investors and upcoming launches in the year ahead? Squawk Box, 6 a.m. Eastern, tomorrow. Welcome back. Let's catch you up on a few stories that should be on your radar on a Monday. It's time for Rapid Fire. And here with more on the headlines are Seema Modi, Bill Griffith, and Kate Rogers. Welcome. Uh, let's talk about what a slow go it's been for investors waiting for a big tech breakout. Fang is so 2016. Netflix is 31% off its highs. Amazon still off 15%. Apple off about 4%. And Apple, by the way, up 12% so far in Q3, but still hasn't been able to get back to those new highs. One firm is betting big on the tech giant, though. JP Morgan raised its price target for Apple to 265 243 That's a 20% rally, and they're saying better than expected iPhone sales and 5G will be a catalyst by late 2020. We go through this every year, it seems, with the Apple iPhone cycle. They underestimate, everybody underestimates how many iPhones are going to sell. We hear from suppliers secondhand that they've cut back on this or that, and oh boy, it's just, you know, rain the right. hands. And then, huzzah! They come out with a decent uh, it's numbers. It's sort of like earnings season. Everyone gets really yep. excited for the, the upcoming one. This is 5G. But for the current one, they mark it down, they mark it down, and then they beat, and then they, everybody moves But on. we must remember, though, Apple's priorities are changing, clearly, more to services. So, yes, uh, we are entering a new phase here. But, uh, you know, I think it's the same thing. Well, the phones are still a big time, profit right? center, which goes to the point of raising the price target. Yeah, and 5G could be Apple's key success in China, where iPhone sales are slowing, yet... Apple is still the only foreign company with a top five position in China's smartphone market. But they don't market. even have a 5G phone. Aren't the Chinese handset Chinese makers are way ahead? Way, way Xiaomi, ahead. Huawei, Samsung already has a 5G phone on the market, so competition is certainly high. That's why getting that iPhone with 5G capabilities out sooner rather than later will probably be uh, key. For and Apple. people are probably waiting here in the U.S. for a full rollout in order to upgrade. I have heard people anecdotally say, oh, I'm going to wait till 5G is in place. I feel like people don't really understand what 5G is, <laughs> yeah. but they're like, ah, I'm going to wait it out. 
exist yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but putting you can duct see duct tape on their iPhones. <laughs> hold, hold you can see why. And also, the camera is beautiful. I mean, Todd Hazelton yes. did that big review. We got to see the quality. I think that'll be a catalyst. Yeah, no, I think the, the, if anything, the real story is the 11 seems to be off to a good start. We'll see. Uh, story of the day, the weekend, whatever you want to call it. Fast fashion retailer Forever 21 is officially filing for bankruptcy. The company is going to close up to 350 stores worldwide, including nearly 200 here in the U.S. Its strategy of having bigger stores and keeping e-commerce to only about 16% of sales not panning out. It joins a growing list of retail bankruptcies this year, including Payless Shoes, uh, Jim Barry, and Charlotte Roos, guys. I think one of the things uh, that would eventually bring Forever 21 down, these massive, massive stores. I mean, a few in New York City are about four floors high. I know in a lot of the malls, another big issue, they're a big mall tenant, right. obviously. They had these huge, huge stores with repetitive merchandise. And the quality was never great. I, I said in the break, I spent a lot of my hard-earned Dairy Queen money in high school at Forever 21. Do you regret that now? Well, because I could afford it, right? No, I mean, right, it was no, like I, right I, in my totally. price range. But the quality was never great. And I think now you can but order things that are not great quality Here's Amazon, the question. Right? So <laughs> if the 16-year-olds or whatever are mm -hmm. not shopping at Forever 21 as much these days. Where are they going? Where are they going? Amazon, Amazon. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons Forever 21 was so challenged was because they didn't get into the digital e-commerce mm -hmm. opportunity fast enough. And that gave Amazon and eBay but then uh, you, a lot of leverage. You, you have these retail players today that don't have a big online presence, yeah. and they're sort of doubling down on that. So I'm just trying to understand, and I, and I hear people say things like fast fashion is bad for the environment or whatever, right. and I just mm -hmm. wonder with the younger kids. Sustainability is big now, and so I hear reformation right. and the real, uh, the, the real, 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 real. Yeah, yeah but that's all more, much more expensive. Much I mean, more, these were yeah. a five to twenty dollar price point. I mean, that's right. what a high school kid can afford. Well, you I think can if they're buying it on their own. I mean, there's that's true too. We have a lot of consignment stores in town, and, and I'm, there's also Rent the Runway, which yeah. has well, also done well. well. They've they had my friends that have been issued. Right. Yeah, there's so much demand, they yeah. can't keep up with it. That was the yeah. latest story. Absolutely. No, that, that I think is also a fascinating one in terms of some of these startups that are struggling to, to expand in size. But for the mall operators, too, that's they're leaving a literally a big hole in yeah. some of these malls uh, to fill. All right, how about this? A new study from the U.S. Census Bureau finds the fastest growing commute in America is no commute at all. Working from home, yay, has now taken over public transportation <laughs> as the third most popular commute with more than one in 20 Americans doing it every day. Three quarters of people still drive solo to work. They though. can do it in radio, but we can't do it in television. I was going to say, yes. one day, yeah. when you can tell Holograms, yeah. Bill. Holograms. Hologram, okay. Ooh, My that. son works in uh, the technology industry, as you know, and he uh, works from home one day, two days a week, uh, for the most part, and, uh, you know, multiply that exponentially, sure. and you get a whole bunch of people that don't go to work. What happens to all those desks that people used to use? I mean, I've heard it actually be an issue for some landlords, maybe even for the WeWorks of the world right. in the future, but that a lot of companies are shrinking their footprint and doing the desk hopping stuff that we all hate, but that in order to basically compensate for the fact that only four out of five employees might be in the office on any given day. I think, too, that's an added, what you just mentioned, an added bonus for younger workers in particular to have one or two days a week where they don't actually have to come into the office. I think there's a big appeal. I have many friends that do that. But my they yeah, love he, it. he used to do summer Fridays mm -hmm. for us growing up, which was great. So I, I agree, like, there's definitely the younger workers, if you listen, anyone who doesn't have to go into the office, it's a perk, but it's definitely still a perk. No, no. Right? We love coming into the office. <laughs> we don't get us Well, wrong. guys, we're yes, out of luck. Yes. We, this is it. We're not doing this from home. One interesting <laughs> nugget in this, which goes back, remember when Marissa Meyer came into Yahoo mm -hmm. and clamped down on the working from home thing and said it, you know, people weren't efficient, what have you. One of the places that was asked uh, where they've seen the work from home population rise sharply is Utah. Mm -hmm. The state is testing a work from home program for its employees. They're going to roll it out more widely after finding that productivity rose more than 20% in the test period. It was interesting. People are likely to work from home in a lot of states like Utah, Colorado, Oregon, where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. And I can say that a lot of these states where ha they have a beautiful backdrop, beautiful mm -hmm. scenery. I think a lot of people, anecdotally speaking, want to spend more of, their, more of their time outside of the office. They're more inclined to take that hike if it's only 10 minutes yep. away, whereas here in the city, Can't it's two really hours away. What, Bill? Uh, I, I no, just no. feel no, Come no, on. No. This is, I want to hear some old school, like, you kids and these hikes. You got to get to the I office. Think the importance yeah. of productivity and overall awareness. <laughs> Vermont guys, I did the remote worker grant story in Vermont. I too. Do. Last thing I'll say, I guess I'm on an environmental kick today, but uh, it, what I hear, a third of our uh, transportation emissions are from 
this alone from driving to work. So see, it's eco-friendly. Environmentally yes. friendly. That's We're doing important. it for the birds. And by the way, I only say about 25% of the things that come to my mind. <laughs> Which it's is called job uh, you know, security. security yeah. filter. <laughs> uh, California's governor today signed into law that Fair Pay to Play Act. Remember this one, it's the bill allowing college athletes in the state to profit off their name, image, and likeness. It's received support from superstar athletes like LeBron James and Draymond Green, but the NCAA obviously is against it. Some are saying it might not even be legal. The Wall Street Journal recently noted this legislation may violate the Commerce Clause. If every state can supersede the NCAA's rules, the organization would be rendered impotent and irrelevant. Well, it, it, what it violates is the Constitution uh, because the Constitution clearly says that the U.S. Congress can only enact laws that it pertain to interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. And all of the universities that would be affected by this law in California play sports out of state, hmm. which makes it then interstate commerce related. Interesting. And that could be the argument against that. But the, the, a lot is going to happen between now and 2023 when this thing is enacted. Uh, the, you know, the NCAA is maybe going to make some changes. I mean, there's a lot going on here. And by the way, why did it fall to the California legislature to enact a law like this? What, what do they get out That's of this? That actually speaks to how California is making a big gamble here. They're hoping that there will be no change before that 2023 ruling comes into play. So it puts the spotlight on the NCAA to respond, but also California is saying, hey, we have four of the teams in the Pac-12, and we're hoping that being a big driver of ratings and just being a big kahuna in the sports market, that we be, they'll be able to drive change here. However, However, what you're forcing these universities to do in California then is to decide, do you follow the law or do you follow the NCAA rules? Right. You can't do both as it stands now. But again, as I said, it's going to change before it's 2020. It's got to be settled. I think that. Newsom, though, had a point in saying that basically every student here can market off of their name and likeness. People are profiting off of these athletes. Why not allow them to do the same? I mean, where this falls in terms of the Constitution, one thing, but I think he has got a good point there. And LeBron James is on board. Too, Even so. if the NCAA goes in this direction, which might be the, the solution here, the journal also made an interesting point that if you want to talk about, the, you know, Title IX was meant for there to be gender parity, mm -hmm. uh, that all of the money is clearly going to go to the male football and basketball stars who make millions and millions off of this, uh, maybe to the chagrin of everybody else. But well, that's, wait a minute, what about female gymnasts, female tennis players? They'll do okay, but they're not going to do better than, well, you know, the biggest of yeah. the big, we don't think. But it's a long time from now. And maybe they'll have CBD to help them. Uh, this is our, our last little piece of the day. CBD products and athleisure wear, two of the most rapidly growing trends in the U.S. And now you can combine them because there's an online retailer called Akabata, which is a CBD play in the name. Anyway, they're now offering a line of CBD-infused sports bras, leggings, and other items promoting recovery and wellness. Prices, guys, start at $125 for a sports bra that can be worn up to 40 times before the CBD oil runs out. <laughs> Have athleisure brands run out of ideas? The only way that they can distinguish themselves is to infuse CBD into their leggings? I mean, come on. This is, this is <laughs> never a bad idea to market something like this to people with too much money to yeah, spend. Income. I mean, $180, and you can wear them 40 times, and they'll work really well. The real problem, too, you is they can... you wash it in the meantime? You, apparently, you wash it, but the, these claims are so unvetted and unverified. Well, that's exactly Very the little thing. Research. You know, where's the FDA again in all of this? And, and the FDA mean, kind of said, to, if you think it works, it might you work have for to you. Get FDA or approval on leggings But now? they're a little distracted by vaping right now, is what yep. I think. I mean, suddenly, they have a huge national crisis to deal with. This probably yep. gets pushed down another rung, and they're just going to be left with Kate using it for her dog baths. We use it for my, my dog's baths. That's right. <laughs> but we give them CBD. Them, yeah, because it to calms calm them down. Yeah, that's right. right. It works for us. Just making sure I understand. <laughs> Thank oh, you all. Ollie. Appreciate it. <laughs> Siva Modi, Dom Chu, and Kate Rogers. From J.P. Morgan's IPO woes to Goldman's consumer banking flop, big banks are feeling the pressure as we move into the fourth quarter after being September's best performing sector. Will the rally be derailed? That's next. This is Charlie. Hi. This is Charlie's truck, Hank. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Find out what you need to do to prepare at gov.uk slash Brexit. Wood in the lounge. Tiles in the kitchen. Carpet in the bedroom. Sorry, no sound effect for that. 
Ugh, never mind. The new Dyson V11 Absolute at Curry's PC World senses, adapts, and deep cleans all floor types. It's Dyson's most powerful, intelligent cordless vacuum with an LCD screen that shows its charge level. Plus, get a Curry's gift card worth £50 when you trade in your old vacuum and buy any Dyson cordless vacuum. Try in-store today at Curry's PC World. Offer ends 22nd October. Jamie Theakston and Amanda Holden. Hot breakfast. Tom Hanks is our special guest. You're either being punished or rewarded. I'll let you decide. I did do a whole show of Grease on my front lawn when I was a kid. We charged everyone 10p. We raised a fiver and I gave it to Bishop's Waltham Gymnastics Club towards a new crash mat. Do they get the crash mat? I mean, it took a couple more years, but yeah. It does happen to normal people like you. You've won £20,000. <laughs> well done. I love this game. And Amanda Holden. Weekdays from 6.30. Listen on your radio, global player or smart speaker. Play hard. Tonight, it's Man United v Arsenal in one of the league's biggest rivalries. And with Now TV, you can watch all the action live for a one-off payment of just 9 99 Hold on, they're checking with VAR. That's confirmed, it's 9 99 Unbelievable stuff. So, to only pay for the games that matter to you, grab a Now TV Sky Sports Day Pass. Search Now TV Sports. 18 plus content streamed by internet, full terms apply. Tune in puts you on the sideline for the 2019 college football season free all year long. With college football on TuneIn, hear the home and away call for more than 140 schools live, regular season matchups and rivalry games, conference championships and bowl games, the college football playoff. The throw, he steps up, he's going deep down the right side, and Rose You can listen to it all for free. The end zone, touchdown! At home, on campus, or on the road, hear the excitement and pageantry of college football all season long, free on TuneIn. <laughs> Welcome back. A wave of disappointing IPOs and turmoil in the repo market putting pressure on the banks as we enter the final quarter of the year. The sector has already been under pressure from the move into passive investing and the recent attempts by the likes of Goldman Sachs to move into consumer banking don't appear to be paying off. Can the financials, which are the best sector for the month of September, keep rallying? Let's bring in Jeff Hart. He's principal at Sandler O'Neill, along with CNBC's senior markets commentator, Mike Santoli. Michael, just start with you. And um, you know, I, I don't know if Goldman's emblematic of the pack, but this the journal piece over the weekend about its efforts to kind of reinvent itself with consumer banking show that they've actually lost quite a lot of money on the effort, and it's not clear it's bearing out just yet. It's not, uh, Kelly, and it's it's sort of interesting if you think of the backstory for why Goldman is heading in this direction, right? I mean, uh, clearly a lot of the edge that it has had in the past, its franchises and institutional trading in investment banking have been dulled by regulation, by technology, by all these things we know have been going on for a very long time. And I do think that, you know, Goldman and many other firms would say, well, we were forced to become a bank holding company. We have the technological infrastructure to create a lending engine for the consumer and emphasize other high margin businesses. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be uh, nearly as profitable uh, in terms of returns as our old businesses were. So this is the fix I think some of these firms are in. Right. And Jeff, what's your rating on Goldman? How do you view their uh, prospects? I mean, we've got a buy on it. I actually like Goldman a lot here still. Uh, the, the article today was, was pretty negative, and it did point out that, you know, profitability hasn't been great in the, in the consumer business, certainly, or the, the losses have been, been building up. But I think you've got to take a step back and understand Goldman is investing in the long term here. They're building businesses, and that's the way it goes when you start a new business. You're going to have losses for a while. We're looking at kind of the consumer business having about a 60 basis point drag in their ROE this year. You know, they're, they're potentially going to push a 13% ROE this year. So I think it's, it's pretty manageable in the greater scheme of things. And, <coughs> excuse me, but I, as mentioned earlier. I'm, yeah, I wonder, Jeff, actually, to, to that point, because the, it raised for me a lot of questions about whether the Wall Street business model is fundamentally broken or not. You know, is it just going to be that Wall Street's smaller but still is profitable in the future? So, for example, Morgan Stanley, you know, some of the others who are more pure play out there can, I mean, d how would you rank them? Would you say that, hey, there's still a place uh, for them? You can still do quite well. Their returns on equity still look pretty good or no? Yeah, I think there definitely still is a place for them. It's not going to necessarily be like it was. But remember, if you look back pre-crisis, 
you probably had a 13, 14% average ROE out of these companies. But in good times, it'd be 30, and in bad times, they'd break even. Hmm. Well, now we're seeing a much more stable 13, 14% ROTCE out of these guys. So, I mean, the volatility has declined some, but I think there's definitely still room. And the big key here is, they're focused on the capital markets. And if you look back over, you know, as far back as we have data, capital markets globally grow at a multiple of GDP. So, I mean, these businesses should still have some legs to grow, though it's not going to be part of the go-go days maybe we saw, you know, 15 years ago. Mike, what would you add to that, especially as we get kind of late cycle? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I do agree that, look, if you look at the way these companies are now valued, they have very modest valuations which don't, which don't imply they're going to get back to prior levels of profitability. So from an investor perspective, maybe the market has figured this out. But I do think that you could look at things, and I don't want to generalize too much from one market phase, but the way that the IPO market has really taken this slide, and not just because public investors say we don't want to pay up for these unicorn business models. Also, just look at how they've traded on day one, right? I mean... Clearly, the underwriters thought they had demand behind them on Peloton, on Uber, mm -hmm. on Lyft, and they broke price immediately. What does it say about their role as mediators of, uh, between pr providers of capital and consumers of capital that yes. you can kind of misfire serially on that exact transaction? So I wonder if the market's just too quantitative, too systematic, and what they used to do, which was read the market, is just not as easy anymore for them. Jeff, it's an excellent point. I'll, I'll give you the last kind of rebuttal on that. Yeah, I think it's important, I think, not to turn kind of intracycle volatility into the next big downturn. I mean, the, the IPO market's had some headwinds recently, certainly. But, I mean, I think still things look pretty healthy and as far as they look healthy going forward. I mean, I, th I think there's still a lot of good things going on there. So I'd, I'm cautious to say that the, the kind of headwinds we've seen recently, which have some environmental kind of macro concerns to them. I mean, investors are becoming more discerning, but also some very company-specific issues. You know, I, I don't know that I'd go so far as to say, you know, the IPO market's turning the wrong way. I think we're kind of hitting a pause here. And as we always right. do in cycles, it kind of ebbs and flows. We got to go. Do you also have a buy on Morgan, uh, Jeff? I do not. We have a hold on Morgan Stanley. Why is that real quick? Um, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's become more challenging here, but I, I think the valuation is a little more reflective of kind of what's in their business model. Got it. And I see less upside to EPS versus consensus. I just think the street's a lot closer to what they can earn than they are with Goldman. All right, good stuff. Guys, thank you both. Appreciate it. Jeff Hart and Mike Santoli joining me on the banks today. Smaller vendors can do big business on Amazon, but many have been afraid to speak out publicly about the tech giant's business practices for fear of being suspended. As the antitrust investigations into big tech proceed, that's starting to change. We'll hear from one such seller next. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. This means that traveling to the EU will change. You'll need to check online if your passport is valid for travel to Europe. If you're planning on driving, you'll need to check if you have the right documents to drive and make sure your travel insurance covers all your healthcare needs. To keep your trip on track, check what you need to do at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. No. 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 What are you doing? I don't like any of our preset radio stations. Ugh. We need a new car. With the Jaguar E-Pace at two nine nine a month on personal contract hire, you'll find a reason. That's better. And it's a Jaguar. Initial rental, £3,588. 48-month term, subject to status. 8,000 miles per annum. Excess mileage and return conditions apply. No ownership option. Ends 30th of September. Participating retailers only. Jaguar contract hire. Do you suffer from lopsided cakes? Lasagnas burnt on the outside yet undercooked inside? Then Curry's PC World have the oven for you. Hotpoint's multi-flow technology gives an even cooking temperature and perfect results every time. But it won't stop the kids spilling stuff, which is where the Hotpoint Active Care washing machines come in, removing more than 100 stains at only 20 degrees. And right now, you can remove 30 pounds of selected Hotpoint washing machines or ovens when you trade in your old appliance at Curry's PC World. Offer ends 22nd October. Fly from London Gatwick to Shannon from 32.99 each way as part of a return trip with Aer Lingus and experience something new on your next trip to Ireland. Discover the soaring cliffs and stunning scenery of the wild Atlantic Way. Explore the charming local towns and relax by the fireside with some traditional music and fresh seafood. Smart enjoys a short break in Ireland. Smart flies Aer Lingus. Book now at aerlingus.com. Offer subject to conditions and availability. 
Jamie Thixton and Amanda Holden. Hot breakfast. Tom Hanks yeah, is our sorry. special guest. You're either being punished or rewarded. I'll let you decide. I did do a whole show of Greece on my front lawn when I was a kid. We charged everyone 10p. We raised a fiver and I gave it to Bishop's Awesome Gymnastics Club towards a new crash mat. Do they get the crash mat? I mean, it took a couple more years, but yeah. It does happen to normal people like you. You've won £20,000. <laughs> well done. I love this game. And Amanda Holden. Weekdays from 6.30. Listen on your radio, global player, or smart speaker. Play hard. As federal regulators launch their antitrust investigations into big tech, they're reaching out to the little guys to understand the ways platforms are using or abusing their power. Elon Moy is talking to one business getting squeezed. Technically, by appearing in this interview, we could get in a lot of trouble. Molson Hart has been selling toys for almost 10 years. This is another one of my favorite guys. This is Shlomo. Shlomo the sloth. Stuffed animals, a construction toy called Brain Flakes, even kickboards. Where does he sell all of this? Definitely Amazon by far. Uh, in 2018, 98% uh, of our revenue actually came from Amazon. In a post on Medium, Hart argued that gives Amazon enormous power over his business and ultimately harms consumers. If we're caught selling our products for less on Walmart.com, let's say, than we sell them on Amazon, then Amazon will actually uh, suppress uh, our listings in Amazon search, which tremendously hurts sales. So what do we do? We actually end up raising prices on our other marketplaces to match Amazon. That caught the attention of the FTC. An investigator reached out and Hart spent an hour on the phone with him. It's really hard to find someone who's willing to speak up about an issue uh, when it comes to Amazon because people are afraid to speak publicly. Regulators appear to be casting a wide net. The FTC has reportedly reached out to Snap in its case against Facebook, and a source tells us the Justice Department has sent a subpoena to DuckDuckGo, a search engine that's trying to compete with Google. Other Google rivals, like TripAdvisor and Yelp, say they're finally being heard after trying for years to get the attention of U.S. regulators. It can't just be sort of one squeaky wheel uh, raising this issue. It has to be lots of uh, players who are, are talking about these issues in order to uh, spur the government to take action. For Hart, raising his concern publicly means he could wind up suspended from Amazon because it violates his contract. Going into Christmas, we have, we're going to hit over a million dollars, or at least get really close to it, in inventory. Uh, what happens to the business if we can't sell in November or December? We're a toy seller. What do we do with that inventory? It's going to be a really long haul from that point on if we were to get in trouble. Wow, Elon Moy joins me now. Elon, in watching that, my first thought is, is undercutting Amazon on price the only area of his disagreement with the platform? Because is Amazon allowed to set the rules and say, no, we're not going to let you go somewhere else and charge your products uh, cheaper? Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest issues that he has. And certainly one of the reasons he's bringing that one up is because ultimately he says this raises prices for consumers. So much of the antitrust debate in big tech has been around the question of, you know, this is, these are free platforms, these are free services that consumers are using. How do you create an antitrust argument around it? For him, this is actually causing him to raise prices. Yeah, he's really sticking his neck out at an important time of the year. Uh, Elon, great reporting. Thanks for bringing it to us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Elon Moy in Washington. Boeing left out key safety features it used in previous models in the 737 MAX flight control system. That's according to a Wall Street Journal report. We'll have those details and the latest on Boeing next. I'll shoot you an estimate as soon as I get back to the office. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. This means that travelling to the EU will change. You'll need to check online if your passport is valid for travel to Europe. If you're planning on driving, you'll need to check if you have the right documents to drive and make sure your travel insurance covers all your healthcare needs. To keep your trip on track, check what you need to do at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. No. 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 What are you doing? I don't like any of our preset radio stations. Ugh. We need a new car. With the Jaguar E-Pace at 299 a month on personal contract hire, you'll find a reason. 
That's better. And it's a Jaguar. Initial rental, £3,588. 48-month term. Subject to status. 8,000 miles per annum. Excess mileage and return conditions apply. No ownership option. Ends 30th of September. Participating retailers only. Jaguar contract hire. Wood in the lounge. Tiles in the kitchen. Carpet in the bedroom. Sorry, no sound effect for that. Ugh, never mind. The new Dyson V11 Absolute at Curry's PC World senses, adapts and deep cleans all floor types. It's Dyson's most powerful, intelligent cordless vacuum with an LCD screen that shows its charge level. Plus, get a Curry's gift card worth £50 when you trade in your old vacuum and buy any Dyson cordless vacuum. Try in-store today at Curry's PC World. Offer ends 22nd October. For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter, get further... Faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. Jamie Theakston and Amanda Holden. Hot breakfast. Tom Hanks is our special guest. You're either being punished or rewarded. I'll let you decide. I did do a whole show of Grease on my front lawn when I was a kid. We charged everyone 10p. We raised a fiver and I gave it to Bishop's Walsham Gymnastics Club towards a new crash mat. Do they get the crash mat? I mean, it took a couple more years, but yeah. It does happen to normal people like you. You've won 20,000 (laughs) pounds. Well done! I love this game. Mars Breakfast with Jamie Thiexton and Amanda Holden. Weekdays from 6.30. Listen on your radio, global player or smart speaker. Play hard. Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg announcing the company is taking immediate action to ensure the safety of Boeing products. This after the Wall Street Journal reported it emitted a key safeguard in the 737 MAX model, one that had been in place in earlier planes. Let's get to Phil LeBeau with more on all of this. Phil. And Kelly, those safeguards that Boeing announced today, CEO Dennis Mullenberg actually taking the recommendations from the board of directors that were announced last week, instituting those along with a few others, basically saying we need to do a better job when it comes to safety. With regard to the Wall Street Journal report, that did not trigger Dennis Mullenberg's actions today, but clearly he will be questioned about this by uh, congressional members when he goes to Capitol Hill next month. Uh, It's all going to be about why were there some uh, redundancies, if you will, regarding the MCAS flight control software on military versions of the 737 MAX that were not there for the commercial versions. The fourth quarter is what it's all about, guys. This is the quarter when Boeing not only has to get the plane recertified, it has to then get it signed off on by not only FAA, but other regulators around the world, and then get it back in service. That is the goal. They've got 90 days to do all of that, and they say that they will still make that. Meanwhile, you've got well over 500 planes uh, and more than 350 with airlines, and then you've got these others that have been built, more than 500 altogether that have been parked. As you take a look at shares of Boeing, it right now is hovering in that 378 to 380 range, Kelly, and it's all about can they execute now in the fourth quarter. All right, Phil, thanks very much. We appreciate it, Phil LeBeau there. That does it for the exchange today. Thanks for joining me. Power Lunch starts right now. It most certainly does, Kelly. Thank you. And we will see you over here in just a moment. Welcome, everybody. I'm Tyler Matheson. And here is what's new at 2 for you on Power Lunch. The D.C. drama heating up. President Trump fighting back as the House impeachment push rolls on. But for now, Wall Street does not seem too concerned. Plus, Forever 21, uh, not forever, maybe, filing for bankruptcy as the retail apocalypse picks up steam. We will tell you who could be the next victim here. And later, the consumer conundrum. One group of stocks is struggling despite the strength of the American consumer. And we'll explain as Power Lunch begins right now. Lots of green on this fall Monday. Take a look at the markets. All three of the major Uh, Measures that we follow are in the green. The Dow and the S&P just 2% from record highs as we look to finish out the third quarter. This, of course, the last trading day of it. And check out Apple jumping as J.P. Morgan says the stock could soar as iPhone sales heat up. We will have more on that, Kelly. Tyler, thanks. The ongoing impeachment inquiry into President Trump's dealings with Ukraine, taking the turmoil in Washington to new heights. Eamon Jabbers is live in Washington with the very latest. Eamon? 
Kelly on Squawk Box this morning. We got a sense of how some people in the White House are viewing this impeachment process up on Capitol Hill. Peter Navarro, the president's trade advisor, was on and he gave us he gave us his view. Here's what he said. This is an attempted coup d'etat, an end run around the ballot box, and these radical Democrats have, have they, they've told us this much. I, I think it's war. Um, the the uh, Congress has declared war on this president, the electoral process, and the American people. And, and that matches the tone of what you hear from aides around here, as well as a sense of resignation that this could be a long process that's going to require uh, a real robust White House effort to rebut these allegations up on Capitol Hill. Uh, and speaking of Capitol Hill, Kelly, Mitch McConnell was on CNBC earlier today. There had been some speculation that McConnell might not move forward with an impeachment trial if the House of Representatives were to go forward and impeach the president. But McConnell said his hands are tied. Here's how he explained it. The Senate impeachment rules are very clear. Uh, the Senate would have to take up an impeachment uh, resolution if it came over from the House. So McConnell there suggesting that no matter what happens, if the House impeaches the president, which is we're a long way from that step, but if that were to happen, then ultimately, he says, the Senate would have to take it up. Doesn't specify what they would do with it and how he would handle an impeachment trial in the Senate, but suggesting that we could see a similar process there uh, if it gets that far down the line, as we saw uh, under Bill Clinton's impeachment back in 1999, Kelly. We should see the president here in a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll see if he makes any news, and we'll bring that to you as soon as we have that as well. Eamon, there's some speculation about what it would mean for the Senate to take up uh, that inquiry. Could it just right. mean that Mitch McConnell says, yep, we're going to take it up, we're going to vote to dismiss it. Yeah, you could have a vote, you know, right away to dismiss without the long and involved trial process that we saw uh, under Bill Clinton. I was in the chamber when the Senate acquitted Bill Clinton back in 99. Uh, and, you know, that was a, a big sort of set piece. You know, William Rehnquist was there with the robes. He had special robes with the gold shoulders on them that he had designed just for the occasion. You know, could McConnell try to short circuit that and just move straight a, straight away to a vote? Uh, that's one possibility. He didn't specify today, but he does say uh, he'd feel forced to take it up at least. Okay. I appreciate it, Eamon. Thanks very much. Eamon Jarrett of the White House. All right. With impeachment talks uh, ramping up, many expect legislation to hit a standstill in D.C. as Democrats conduct their investigation. However, our next guest has a somewhat unique take, saying that impeachment could possibly help at least parts of the legislative agenda. With us in studio to explain, Libby Cantrell, PIMCO's head of public policy. This is an interesting take that you have here. Apparently, um, yes. Apparently. <laughs> I mean, we're saying it is. So yeah, what, perfect. Who else well, it matters? is that, of course. No one else matters. Uh, but specifically with respect to the USMCA, yep. you think that this may give both sides an opportunity to demonstrate that they can get things done for the American people, basically. Yes, I think, I mean, you look at the fact that there are 31 Democrats in the House uh, Democratic Caucus who won election in districts that President Trump won. And so those folks, the majority makers, if you will, because those are the people who um, allowed the Democrats to get the majority, they are going to be under pressure, increasing pressure, if this impeachment proceeding does go through, uh, to show that, yes, they may be impeaching the president, but at the same time, they can actually get things done. And so... There was some momentum around the USMCA. It's not necessarily a slam dunk, but I think I would argue that there is going to be more pressure, especially among those centrist Democrats, to show that they can get done. And the USMC is sort of, USMCA is sort of low-hanging fruit. And then, the, and then the other side to that, the, the counter-argument is that the Democrats, the last thing the Democrats want to do is... Uh, give the president a crowning achievement of right. any sort. Of course, of course. And that has sort of been actually my argument for a, lot, for a while, is that why would Speaker Pelosi especially force Democrats to take sort of a, a difficult vote as it is? You know, Democrats don't particularly love to vote on free trade agreements, especially one that would hand a big legislative victory uh, to President Trump. But you have to realize that you know, USTR Ambassador Lighthizer and House Democrats have been negotiating in good faith. The White House has actually been um, made some sort of indication that they're going to try to meet the Democrats sort of in the middle here. Democrats are also saying that they may be able to be a little bit more flexible in terms of some of their demands. So again, I'm not saying this is a done deal, a fait accompli, but I do, I do think that the sort of conventional wisdom that everything legislatively is going to necessarily stop isn't necessarily true, just from a political perspective. Just a, is a, I, I put that theory to Judd, former Senator Judd Gregg last week, and he said 
there's just no way I've I've sat there. There's no way that anything else gets done because this just takes up yeah. all the oxygen in the room. So you're you're right. Strategically, it would seem like this is the perfect way to say we're not just blocking the whole agenda. We're moving forward on stuff that you know and but. Yeah. What do you make of the no, senator's No, of course, no, of course. And I mean, I think it, it clearly is going to take up you know most of the oxygen in the room, if you will. But it's, I think it's also one of the reasons why Speaker Pelosi is holding back these committee folks over the next two weeks when they're in congressional recess, because she wants to get this done as expeditiously as possible, while also still showing the American people that this is not preordained, that this is you know going to be um, subject to a comprehensive investigation, that Democrats aren't necessarily rushing to judgment. At the same time, she doesn't want this tipping over. Over into 2020, informing the real, you know, informing the election uh, process for for the, on the Democratic side, um, but also I think she also wants to leave some room for some legislative wins as well. I would think too there might be another argument here uh, in favor of moving the USMCA forward, and that would be the alternative could be worse for Democrats and Republicans. In other words, they they don't move it forward, and the president says, okay. I'm tearing up NAFTA. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All, game, set, match. Yeah. We're done with that. Yeah. Which might be a worse outcome. So that 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 could yeah. And of spur. course, and as as you know, Tyler, you know the withdrawal. Um, if he, if President Trump says I'm moving forward with withdrawal, that then starts a six month grace period. At the end of which, President Trump actually doesn't have to withdraw. So in some ways, it's a perfect thing for him mm -hmm, to do. Mm -hmm, he can mm -hmm. he can try to withdraw, say he's going to try to force some some action on it. But actually, at the end of the day, not necessarily follow through with his threat. But I think you're right. I mean, look at these ag states. I mean, look at the farmers that are a very important constituency, both to the president, but also to Republicans in Congress. You, they are saying they want certainty around NAFTA 2.0. And again, I think that you know Democrats might be more inclined to moving this, and if you know Republicans may politically be incentivized. But as well. it's tell that that's fascinating about the six month grace period, and it also tells me that people are already exploring this avenue, which is well, let's assume that the next thing that happens is we might he might threaten to pull us out of NAFTA. I mean, that that we've already advanced a couple. Steps. Yeah, look, like, we've, we've been talking about this with Pimco. Yeah, yeah, we've been talking about this with Pimco for you know, almost two years. Um, just because, again, I mean, he. he First of all, he thinks, um, and I knew I think there's there's some justification to this. He thinks that his tariff threats have worked; that they brought folks to the negotiating table. He's you know brought China to the negotiating table. He would argue that he's gotten a, ne a better NAFTA agreement because of it. And so you know he he likes these types of um, negotiating tactics, you know, if you will. So we've been we've been focused on, on this as a possibility and a threat to markets for, for a while. Libby, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of you. I'm <laughs> Job control. security. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> all right, thanks. Thanks. It's the final day of the third quarter as investors ramp up, now looking to the end of the year. There is one thing in particular that Wall Street is watching. Bob Bassani is on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with more. Bob? And it's fourth quarter earnings, Kelly. The great earnings recession fear that dominated the first quarter, that companies would dramatically lower earnings expectations in the second half of the year due to trade and tariffs and a larger global slowdown. Well, that's never come to pass. Earnings remained flattish, a word I've been using for months now, for the first quarter, the second quarter, and now even for the third quarter, as you see here, estimates showing a gain for the fourth quarter of roughly 4%. The two issues that would move earnings in one direction or the other remain unresolved. That's the trajectory of trade talks. Are there more or less tariffs? That's all anybody wants to know. And the Fed, are we on hold or not? Still don't know the answer to that either. While there have been no wholesale attempts to lower earnings in the fourth quarter, there's a couple of troubling trends that I've seen in the last couple of weeks. First, Q, uh, 13 of the 14 companies that have so far reported Q3 numbers, these are the earliest reporters so far, they've seen their estimates for the fourth quarter lower, 13 of the 14. That's a very high percentage, north of 90% lowering for the fourth quarter. And we've seen notable downward revisions from some big companies, Carnival and FedEx and even Micron at the end of last week. The other trend that's notable is that energy is seeing very major downward revisions, even in the third quarter, particularly in exploration and production. Estimates for the third quarter here are down 20% since July. The main reason, of course, excessive production is keeping prices low. So a couple of troubling trends to keep an eye on, but no wholesale revisions yet for Q4. Back to you, Kelly. All right, Bob. Thank you, sir. Bob Bassani. And meanwhile, stocks are pushing higher for the last trading day of the quarter. Most will agree Q3 has been a pretty crazy one. So what should we expect for Q4? Let's bring in Kevin Divney. He's manager of U.S. large cap funds with Russell Investments. And Scott Wren, a senior global equity strategist with Wells Fargo Investment Institute. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, Kevin, let me just ask you about the, the value kind of momentum rotation we started to see take place in the last few weeks, uh, but only started to see. Do you think that's going to have legs or is telling us uh, anything about Q4? 
markets confirming what's been going on in the backdrop of increasing macro uncertainty. And now we're on the cusp of getting better visibility into earnings. So the value rotation trade has been maybe 10 years in the making. Right. Uh, you have growth <laughs> up something like 324 percent versus 114 percent for value since um, uh, 2009. The yield curve has an effect on that. When you saw the gyrations in the bond market, you could extrapolate that there was a technical factor pushing the value stocks up. But a change in leadership, a rotation in market factors usually presages a change in the macroeconomic environment.